I had a whole flock of kids before I ever gave birth. My husband and I went through about five years of infertility, and I lived out all my parenting dreams by playing auntie to my friends' kids. I took them on hikes. I played hide-and-seek, dress-up, and firefighters. I taught them to finger paint with pudding. I frequently offered to babysit and then read piles of stories and patiently paced the floor to get them to sleep. I never got mad or frustrated. I was the perfect mom. Then I had kids of my own, and despite all the practice with my friends' kids and all the books I've read, I'm not so perfect anymore. I do many of the things I said I'd never do. Hello, frozen dinners, too much screen time, and losing my temper. And I don't do many of the things I thought I would do, like crafting and putting them to bed on time. I teased my mother mercilessly for the crazy outfits we wore in old photos and our disheveled hair, and now my kids easily rival those mismatched ragamuffins in those old photos. Not only that, but my kids aren't the kids I imagined. I thought my kids would love school, love each other, love me. And they do, sometimes. It turns out, when the rubber pacifier hits the road, we rarely turn out to be the moms we thought we would be. But in so many ways, we're better than those fantasy moms we dreamed up. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Before I start today's episode, I want to remind you that my online laundry workshops are coming up this week and next. If you're currently trying to ignore the growing mountain of clothes you should be folding, this is the workshop for you. I'll walk you through several different systems that work for moms with different priorities and personalities, including my own system that requires no sorting at all. Then we'll craft a customized, realistic system that you can start right away. I'll be hosting two live online sessions, one at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Friday, February 6th, and one at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Tuesday, February 9th. You can sign up at HowSheMoms.com. If these dates don't work for you, you can also sign up for a one-on-one coaching session or get a group of friends together for your own private workshop, or even just download the workbook and go through it yourself. Basically, I just want to help you dig out from under that mountain of laundry. Hope to see you there! Today's episode is the first of three episodes about the transition to motherhood. This one, of course, is about our expectations of what we will be like as moms. The next episode will be about many of the changes we go through as we become mothers, from the way we use our time to the physical challenges to the impact on our marriages and our identity. And the third episode will feature the specific stories of a few mothers that I just had to share in their entirety. As I've researched the different stages of motherhood this season, I've realized there are many more books about parenting and the stages the kids go through than books about the changes and stages moms go through. But I found a few, and one of my favorites is a book written in the 80s called The Six Stages of Parenthood. In it, the author Ellen Galinsky identifies the first stage of parenthood as the image-making stage. She says, Expectant mothers and fathers get ready for pregnancy by culling through their images of parenthood. They look back at their own experiences as children with parents, They examine and analyze their friends, relatives, and neighbors, as well as their own experiences as parents. This jives with Celeste Davis's experience as she prepared for motherhood. I asked her what she thought she would be like as a mother. I had so many plans. (laughs) I think I just had a really, um, I don't know, unrealistic sense of my own um, ability to control my situation. Um, because in, in school I was like input equals output, like the harder that I study, the better grades I get. And right. The harder that I work, the better job I could get. Like, it was kind of like the more work I put in, the better my outcome is going to be. And then I became a mom and I'm like, I am working so hard (laughs) and my child still won't listen to me no matter what I do. And it was like this flip of like my old worldview had to like crumble because I'm like, it's not working like the more I pressure for obedience the less obedience I get right and so it was like this reversal and when I yeah when I was pregnant and I was so judgmental and so just like oh my kid would never like be the one in the middle of the store kicking and screaming I would be much better able to handle that or you know or my kid would never be the one to like only eat rolls at <laughs> at Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> they're gonna eat everything. And I often think of like the beginning of my motherhood, like this of this meme of this like old timey you know mother talking to her kid, like saying like you're making it very difficult to be the mother I always thought I would be. 
Yeah. <laughs> but that was my experience of <laughs> early on in motherhood. Like, why aren't, why can't I control this thing? Like I felt like before I could relatively control my life and the outcomes of my life. And you have kids, it's like, oh, this beast is not controllable in the way that I would like to control it. And it's just been a continuous journey of like, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, <laughs> you know, just, it's been a continuous lesson of loving unconditionally, even when your child's behavior is not as you would prefer it, which is, I think, the whole point of <laughs> what I'm supposed to be learning from both motherhood and marriage. Celeste is now a mom of four with much more realistic expectations for herself. She's also a terrific writer. You can find her work at her blog, marriagelaboratory.com. I asked the same question to Rachel Nielsen, the host of one of my very favorite podcasts, 3 and 30 Takeaways for Moms. Because I was the last of all my friends to have kids because we struggled with infertility, I got to watch a lot of their parenting. And I actually have memories of times when I judged their parenting and thought I will never do it that way. And then when I have moments now that I'm a mom, I have like flashbacks to these moments when I judged my friends and I think, oh my goodness, I, am, I need to call them and apologize, even though they had no idea. But a couple of things, I, have, I had a good friend who confided in me that she was feeling down that she yelled at her kids. She never thought that she would yell at her kids, but she did and she was feeling so sad about it. And of course, I listened empathetically, but in my mind, I was like, what kind of a monster yells at young children? Because her kids were like two and four years old. And I just couldn't even fathom that she would yell at them. And then years later, as I was losing it on my young children, I thought of that moment and I thought, oh, apparently I am that kind of monster that yells at young children. So things like that. Or I remember I had a friend whose baby didn't nap very well. And it just always seemed like she couldn't, in my mind, couldn't get it together and like get him on a good sleep schedule. And then when I had a baby that was a really hard sleeper that didn't nap well, that memory came back to me of me thinking, my babies will take two hour naps every day and I will have all of this uninterrupted time to work during my baby's nap times. And of course, I had one baby that was a great sleeper and did that and the other, I did the exact same things and he was a terrible sleeper. So, you know, you can't control it all. And I learned that with time, but those are sort of my eat my words moments yes. from judging my friends in the past. Janet Thompson, a mother of six, had a similar experience of watching and judging her friends parent their kids and also expecting to have much more control over her kids' behavior than she actually did. We talked about how we were going to raise our kids and we were very deliberate about it all because we had a lot of friends that had kids already. We were the youngest in, in the law school. And so all these people were married and they had kids and some of them were really good and some of them were really crazy. And we, we just were absolutely positive that we were never going to let our kids act like some of those kids, <laughs> which it was very, at that time, I think I was very idealistic in thinking that I could, that if I did something, that that would cause my children to be the way they were supposed to be or whatever. <laughs> but now, looking back on it, I realized that I was really, that was really naive because our Heavenly Father has all, all these children and they're all different. And, you know, everybody has their own personalities. And so I think that. The old, as I am a grandmother now, I just take my grandkids as they come. I'm not trying to change their, yeah. their behaviors and stuff. This tendency to judge other moms during this pre-motherhood stage is a common thing among the moms I've talked to, myself included. Now, I'm not usually in favor of judging other mothers, quite the opposite. But I think there's an important distinction here. This kind of judgment, as we're thinking about our impending parenthood, can perhaps more appropriately be called evaluation or analysis. And it's really an important and necessary step to help us identify our values and priorities of our families. And it can be done kindly. We don't have to be mean about the things that we don't want to incorporate into our own motherhood. 
It's especially useful to evaluate our own parents and talk with our spouses about what we liked and didn't like about the way we were raised and about the differences between our families. Of course, it's even more crucial to do this kind of evaluation if we're trying to break a cycle of abuse or other unhealthy behavior from our own upbringing. As we piece together these ideas of what kind of parents we will be, we often make absolute statements like, I will never yell at my kids, or I will always make sure my kid's hair is brushed before church. Those are words that are destined to be eaten. I asked the wonderful moms on the How She Moms Facebook group when they've had to eat their words, and I got some great responses. Elisa Stacy said, I thought I would read to my kids, and I found out that reading anything more than picture books aloud is something I dread. Also crafts. I thought I would do that too. My neighbor Van Oberly swore she would never buy licensed clothing for her kids. They'd always be dressed to the nines like little adults. But, she says, as soon as they showed any joy in any character, there went my bank account. The most common pronouncements people made were about food and screen time. Here's Catherine Griesman. You know, I was all about, like, my kid's not going to eat chicken nuggets and french fries and whatever. Like, we're going to have all this healthy food and she's not going to watch all this screen time. And it wasn't as much when, you know, she was like an infant. But now I'm like, especially with a kid who doesn't eat because they have some sensitivities. I'm like, I get excited when she eats chicken nuggets. (laughs) I got her to eat Nutella on a tortilla and I was over the moon. Um, And so it was like, fruits and veggies and all, you know, like, oh my gosh, I have, I have eaten that like nobody's business. Um, And we're working on the screen time. She definitely gets less now, but we use it as a tool for feeding a lot of the time for distraction because we couldn't get her to eat. And so we had, we used that or sometimes I would read her books, but um, she definitely got a lot more screen time than I ever thought that I would do. And you know what? She's okay. (laughs) So, so far anyway. (laughs) And here's Marissa Young, host of the podcast, Young Honest Mother. I remember specifically screen time. I was like, I'm not going to let my child, you know, be in front of a screen and just like watch shows. And I'm going to be very hands-on and always be there to entertain him and make sure that he has all these activities. And I was that way for a while. And, um, I really burn out on just trying to be everything for him all the time. And it kind of started out very hesitantly. Just all of a sudden he, he saw this video. I don't even know how, uh, when my mom was on her iPad and he like pointed to it, he wasn't speaking full sentences at that point, but he definitely was like, I, I want to watch that. And it was one that was teaching about colors and um and shapes and things like that and i was like well that's that's educational you know that's a show that he could watch and so it started with that and we've had to be before covid19 let me say we were much more intentional about like okay you have a specific amount of show time you know on a like on an interval and then once that time has elapsed and that's it for the day or for the week or whatever it has been we noticed though that my son, he's like an actor. He remembers the lines from things and we'll just say them in conversation <laughs> as we're, we're talking about breakfast and he like repeats word for word with the, the intonation, with the, the mood and the tone and like the movements and everything. So we're like, huh, that's interesting. And um, we realized that he wants to watch the same movie over and over and over again. And so every time, every time he watches it, like by the end, he's picked up a new scene and then he'll perform that throughout the week. Um, So, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is just like realizing that I was the one who was being so rigid with this expectation that I was imposing on myself and relaxing and letting up on that a bit has really shown me that you don't have to have such a, um, an intense approach to, to screen time. It doesn't have to be demonized. We can make of it what we can, and we can set boundaries around it, of course, but to be able to watch him and just be like, okay, so this is who he is. Like he likes, he literally will get up on the stairs and like say, okay, I'm doing a play or like I'm putting on a performance and we'll just rattle off the scenes. And so I wouldn't have seen this side of him 
have we not introduced screen time? And I think it's definitely bringing out actually more of his personality than we even realized was there. Juliana Hall started her image making stage way back in high school. When I was a teenager, I thought I would be such a cool mom. I remember loving to listen to loud music when I was getting ready. And my mom would always get mad and tell me to turn it off. And now that I'm a mom, I'm eating my words. And I really appreciate having some moments of quiet um, and not constantly having all the noise in our house. I also thought it would be super easy to talk to my kids about sex. It would be no big deal. I wanted to have open conversations. And the first time I talked to my daughter about it, I was embarrassed, I was tripping over my words, I was super nervous about what to say, and I'm realizing that being a mom is a lot harder than you think when you're a teenager. (laughs) And Raj Peterson swore she would never freak out like her parents did about grades. My parents used to freak out if I got like a 98 on something, and they were like, what happened to the other two points? I'm like, I'm never going to be that parent. And then I'm like, I catch myself having the same thought, because I think we all have our parents in us. Um, but I do catch myself at least and try to try to avoid that. The problem with all these pronouncements, of course, is that we have no idea how challenging motherhood will actually be. And of course, we've never even met the kids we'll be parenting. This is the realization that has helped Devin Smitty readjust her expectations. Generally, I thought my children would be mostly like my husband or I in character and personality. My husband and I are very alike, very similar. We're both like very organized. We're neat and tidy. We're role followers. Um, And so whenever I thought, before I had kids, whenever I thought of these like hypothetical kids I would have and then came up with all these things I would or wouldn't do with them, it was always in this context of like imagining them like us. And, And then they're not at all, you know? And so... For example, like if I thought, oh, we are going to have children who um, love the same things we love. So therefore, we'll never be people who X, Y, Z, something that's not along our lines. Well, my kids are their own people and they're different. And so I've had to adapt my own expectations and thoughts about what we would or wouldn't do to who they are, you know, and letting them be who they are versus who I always imagined they might be. There's a lot around like what I thought my kids would eat or I would allow my kids to eat or not eat that I've let go and really loosened the reins on. Like I really thought before I had kids, this is so silly, I can't even like articulate it, but I'm going to go for it. Like, oh, well, kids just learn to eat based on what you give them. So if you never give them Cheetos, then they just won't even know that that's an option and then they won't crave it all the time or you never give them mac and cheese or if you don't give them the choice of mac and cheese, then they're going to eat your salmon because they're not going to go hungry. I thought that. And um, wow, have I really been humbled in that (laughs) way. It's like, yeah, so I've eaten my words with what my kids eat for (laughs) sure. Um, And like their level of involvement and stuff and like expectations for how they sort of behave around other people. And we obviously maintain like a baseline expectation about manners and all of that kind of thing. But like this goes right in the vein of wanting them to be like my husband and I, which is like charming and socially engaging and always wanting to like um, engage with other people and be super friendly. And like one of my kiddos in particular is not wired that way. And so I always imagined like, well, I'll never have a kid that like won't look at you when they say hello or I'll, you know, I'll make sure that my kids are always like super charming on a a call with their grandparents or really engaged. And I've had to like really check my expectations and be like, how do I help honor who my kid actually is and where their boundaries and comfort zones are and still help them have a relationship with their long distance grandparents, for example, or um, make sure that they can still be polite to the hostess, but do it in a way that do things. Um, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat because, and you're going to need to know all of those ways in order to raise different personalities. Yeah. Like, I don't think you can appreciate how different kids can be until you have multiple kids. 
Devin is a mother of one girl and one boy and coaches parents of highly sensitive kids with Megan Thompson Coaching, one of the leading experts in this area. I'll link to MeganThompsonCoaching.com in the show notes. Not only do we know nothing about our individual children ahead of time, we don't even really know what the world will look like as our children grow. I swore my kids would not have cell phones until they were at least 16. It just seemed so unnecessary and even hazardous with smartphones and social media, all those things. Then my oldest hit middle school, and I realized that I wanted to be able to reach him, and I didn't want him using my phone to text and call his friends. Plus, by the time I decided it was time to let him have a smartphone, technology had improved so I can block web browsers and choose exactly what apps he has and how long he can use them. There are just way too many unknowns to make any kind of blanket statements about what we will and will not do as parents. Ellen Galinsky talks about this in her book, too, how once we actually become mothers, we have to reconcile the images with reality. And that process can be hard, as Andrea Quimby, currently the mother of one toddler, has learned. And I also wasn't the mom I thought I was going to be. I'm still not, really. I think I had this image of the kind of mother that I was going to be, and it turns out I'm a little bit different than what I thought. And I'm still, I think, kind of uh, working through being okay with that. It can be an actual grieving process to bury that image we had of the kind of mom we thought we would be, and then start actually becoming a real mom. For Catherine Griezmann, a mom of one daughter and a family therapist, this started right at her daughter's birth. My expectation had been my story and my, like, I just had always wanted to breastfeed. It was like my mom breastfed all her kids. My, I still call her my mother-in-law, but technically she's my ex-mother-in-law. Like she breastfed her kids and they both had, you know, six kids, five kids, all natural, just, you know, this strong woman, you just pop out these babies and your body can do it. And I just, I had wanted that experience and was like, from the birth on, nothing was how I had expected it to be. And this story that I had told myself that was reinforced by all the people around me. And then it was totally different. I didn't have a natural birth. I, I made it seven and a half hours. And then I was in the hospital I had I'd gone into labor right at midnight and I was I was sick and I had worked right up until the day I went into labor and like I was sick and I was I shouldn't have done that I was run down but I was so determined not to use any of my precious maternity leave days off before my baby came and so like and, and I was still in oncology and I had a kid on my queso dying in hospice that day and like I was so I had nothing left to give. I was so drained. My water popped right at midnight. I hadn't (laughs) had any contractions prior to, and it was like getting hit by a bus. I was like, I just got run over by a tractor trailer truck. And so I, I made it until 730 in the morning and the midwife came in and I was like, the exact words I will never forget. I told her, I said, I'm in despair. (laughs) I need help. And so the anesthesiologist came in, you know, and I was like, I can't do it. So I got an epidural and then she wasn't born until 1.30 the next day. And I was like, I would have never made it. I was so exhausted. But that I had to, there was so much grief. So I had to grieve that because I put all this pressure on myself. I wanted to experience this beautiful natural birth. That was a story that, you know, I had, I had told myself this expectation of like, you can do it. Don't be weak. Like you got this. Women do this every day. They have babies in cornfields. Like, <laughs> you can have a baby in a hospital. And so that was, it was, it sounds silly now, four years later, but that was incredibly hard for me. And then she couldn't eat because she had, I didn't find out, you know, till a while later, but she had a lot of oral motor sensitivities, but I didn't know that I was a young new mom. I never had a kid. And I was like, the story that I, you know, thought was like, you just put them on the boob and they eat and it's like beautiful and amazing. And then you just like carry this baby around and feed them wherever you want. You know, it's like a piece of cake, but it wasn't, (laughs) it was horrible. (laughs) Like it was, it was horrible because I felt so inadequate, like I couldn't feed my baby. And the reality was I could feed her, just not the way that I had wanted to, but I couldn't let that go in those moments. I mean, you've had kids. I was like, so postpartum, I was like out of my mind, (laughs) so sleep deprived. Once I finally realized this several months in that I was grieving 
And I gave myself permission to just grieve it and be sad about it. Then at that point, I think I could finally move on. And I just, I stopped trying to nurse her. I still pumped. So I pumped until exclusively from about, I don't know, like month two and a half to three until she was 10 months old. Um, wow. I wanted to make it a year, but I just didn't have enough milk. The pumping just didn't, didn't do it. But when I finally just let myself grieve that loss, that expectation that I had, that it was going to be this, like this beautiful thing that's going to feed my baby, you know, I was able to move on a little bit, but it, there was so much grief in the joy and it was so hard, but I wasn't prepared for that at all. Luckily, this image-making stage and the subsequent reality check gets less dramatic with more experience. Here's Devin again. I'm so type A, so I read all the books and, like, earmarked pages of, like, for everything, like, nursing and nap schedules. And I was really clinging tight to, like, if I just have the right information and do the right things, this will all go smoothly. And that's not true. And I was making myself miserable yeah. trying to control that. And so that made my first six months with my first kid a lot less enjoyable, too. It was it was me choosing to, like, have these really high expectations for myself and not being able to live into that and then, like, constantly be, being disappointed in myself. Where with my son, he came very quickly. So I basically had like two babies at one time. I had a very young toddler and a newborn baby. He had a lot of medical issues right oh. out of the gate too, which seems like it would have been really hard, but it was actually such a blessing because it forced me to like let go of control. It was oh. like, okay, this kid's got to be at a specialist doctor that's an hour away twice a week for special blood work. He needs all of this extra care. And so my nap schedule that I had highlighted out for my daughter, that's just not going to happen, Devin, let it go. You know, it was almost like it gave me permission to just let some stuff go yeah. that I didn't give myself permission for the first time around. Um, and, and so I enjoyed his infancy like so much more. It was like, okay, you know what? The house is not going to get cleaned. He's not going to wear super cute outfits every time we go out. We're just not going to go out very often because I just can't even get myself dressed, you yeah. know? So it was like, I just let go of so much more and it made the whole ride so much more enjoyable. That's what I wish I had known going in. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll be fine. I think that's where this like started from was you saying how resilient they are. Yeah. It's like, they're going to be fine whether they take that nap perfectly swaddled in their own crib or they take it in a car seat at soccer practice, or they don't take it. They're yeah. fine. They're going to be fine. You're not even going to remember six months from now yeah. when they first rolled over. They're or... not going to therapy for that. Right. <laughs> right. It'll be fine. Yeah. Everything's going to be okay. I want to leave this episode with that message. You won't mother exactly like you imagined, and that's a really good thing. You'll be a real mom with real mistakes and real successes. Your kids will be real kids who also make real mistakes and you get to learn and grow together, whether you eat lima beans and crank up the music together or not. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. If you like it, tell a friend. The bigger the community, the more ideas. There are lots of ways you can add your ideas to the How She Moms community. We have a Facebook group where we share ideas about upcoming topics and help each other solve problems we're facing in motherhood. You can also follow How She Moms on Instagram for quick tips and ideas. And you can go to HowSheMoms.com where you'll find transcripts of episodes and lots of other great resources. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.